Welcome to another of our ongoing discussions on the Book of Mormon. My name is Paul Hoskison, and I'm joined today by friends and colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. On my immediate left is Stanley Johnson. I'm glad you're here. To his left is Eric Huntsman. Uh, I'm glad you're here too. And at the far end of the table is Victor Ludo, an old friend. I'm glad you're here too. We'll be discussing 2 Nephi chapter 9 this day. As mentioned in our last Book of Mormon discussion, chapter 9 forms part of the longer discourse by Jacob, uh, part of, probably of a general conference address to the Nephites. And we've separated out chapter 9 from the rest of his address, which goes from chapter 6 to 10, because chapter 9 is one of the most important and most beautiful all of all explanations of the atonement in Holy Writ. So today we'll concentrate on the atonement of Jesus Christ as is explained in chapter 9 here of 2 Nephi. And right off at the very beginning, I noticed the word covenant in verse 1. That ought to ring some bells with some people. It uh, honestly, uh, I think of the title of the Book of Mormon, Another Testament, but we know that often we can say another covenant might be a better translation. And uh, the covenants of the Lord uh, really, uh, uh, verse 1, And now, my brethren, I have read these things that ye might know concerning the covenants of the Lord, that he has covenanted with all of the house of Israel. One of the brethren once taught that uh, covenants are like the contract and the ordinances are like the signature on the contract. And uh, the covenants of the Lord uh, are crucial in the Book of Mormon. One of the great things that uh, have been restored, uh, if you will, to missing parts of the Bible. Now this word covenants here also refers back to the discussion of Isaiah, which starts uh, Jacob's uh, original uh, discourse. Uh, yes. It had been assigned by Nephi to speak on Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 49. But it seems back there that the discussion is about the gathering of Israel, and suddenly we're now we're talking about the atonement. Well, that's a very interesting thing in chapter 9. It starts out still sounding like it's dealing with the gathering of Israel. At the end of chapter 2, it says they're going to be gathered home to the lands of their inheritance. And in verse 3, he says that, you know, you're going to have these blessings upon your children if you're gathered. Verse 4 starts out sounding like it might still be about the gathering. He says, you've searched the scriptures so that you may know of things to come. Oh, the future gathering. But instead, he says somewhat shockingly, at the end of verse 4, you're going to die. <laughs> it's not about gathering at all. It's about the death of the body. And nevertheless, even though you're going to die, you'll see God in your body. How's that going to happen? So he brings in the Savior and how he has to die. It behooveth the great creator to die so that he can overcome death. There'll be a resurrection and that's part of the atonement. And so we have a shift here from the idea of kind of corporate salvation, the gathering of the people of God, to something that's very, very individual. How is God going to save each of us? And that's what opens the door for this wonderful discussion about the atonement in chapter 9. Uh, and in fact, if I can just insert that... Uh Overcoming death, uh, physical death, and uh, as has been mentioned, uh, the atonement, spiritual death, and verse 3, we can lift up our heads and rejoice because of this. Just as it was the case with, with Lehi in, in 2 Nephi chapter 2, when Book of Mormon prophets teach the plan, and when they teach the atonement, I mean, this is one of the great strengths of the Book of Mormon, they teach the atonement in the whole context. You have creation, fall, redemption from sin, resurrection from death, judgment. And so you've got all of that. And in verse 6, there are some passages, there are some references to the three pillars of that. You've got... Those are the three pillars of eternity that Elder McConkie used right. to talk about. Creation, fall, atonement. Right. Mm -hmm. you have the merciful plan of the great creator and that we're cut off because of the fall. And yet there's a power of a resurrection then leading into verse 7. And this is all part of this infinite atonement. That infinite atonement will be talked about much later on when we get to uh, the, the chapters in Alma, where Alma explains the atonement. But it is an infinite atonement. It's not just, you know, one of those things that's bound by time and by space. It, it, it's infinite. 
when, when the, Jacob talks about this atonement, he gets pretty excited. I sometimes think of Jacob and Nephi as being the most poetic of the prophets of the Book of Mormon. It may be because they had the benefit of a classical Hebrew education. But Vic, what is this in verse 8? Oh, the wisdom of God is mercy and grace. I seem to have seen a lot of these O oh interjections yeah, they're, throughout. They're, they're, the, these are, these, these they look are, like they're yeah. at the beginning of the paragraphs here or something. Well, well, that's a good way to describe it. A beginning of a paragraph, or I, I call it a little attention marker. It's, a, it's like a little firecracker. I mean, more correctly, it might be called sort of a stylistic marker. Mm -hmm. The technical term for it is locutive exclamation. A locu what? what? Locutive. Lo lo locutive exclamation. A, a locution. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a stylistic term. It, it's a particular form of expression or a peculiarity of expression or a peculiarity of phrasing. And so it's a benchmark. It's saying, okay, I day one, Today would probably say, well, it's putting a bullet list together right. on a computer. Well, these are like bullet lists and yeah. these, these little things. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. That makes sense. Good. Okay, Thank you. all right. Better than looking to the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, we, we have six of them, uh, starting in verse 8. Are you, would you outline those for us? Okay, yeah. uh, verse 8 uh, talks about the wisdom of God. Then starting in verse 10, the goodness of God. Verse 13, the plan of God. Verse 17, the justice of God. Verse 19, just one little short verse, but the, the all-important mercy of God. And then verse 20, the holiness of God. So those are the six little bullet list characteristics or attributes of God that Jacob is highlighting. I think he's trying to set a stage here for us to appreciate some of the great attributes of the divine and our relationship to him through these different characteristics as far as us on this earth in our fallen nature. Now, if I know my, my uh, Hebrew literature a little, I'm going to make a wild guess that he's going to take those same six bullet points and use them in the second half of the sermon. Is that right? That's right. He's going to wrap around and come back up that list in an opposite order. We call it an introverted parallelism. Well, don't or use chiasmus. those big words. <laughs> it's, it's just, well, okay, it's an inside out. <laughs> there you oh, go. Okay. Kind of like taking your t-shirt, turning it inside out, reading it backwards. Do you want to walk us through those? Okay, those? well, first of all, we, we go from this introduction about covenants mm -hmm. and uh, the, the introduction of the atonement, and then he's going to tell us the, the means by which they come into power Those with the these O's. attributes of God. Yes. And then in verses 21 through 26, he's going to talk about some of the particular things God then has given us to effectuate these, the gifts okay. of God, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. We'll talk about okay. them here in verses 21 through 26. That's how we connect to his power. Now, is that seven bullet points then that you've got? No, no, no. no. This is, that's a different idea. He's saying, okay. here's our introduction. This is part of the covenant. Here is the divine being. That's B. Uh -huh. Now C is, here's how you're going to connect to it through the okay. first principles and ordinance of the gospel. Good. Now he's going to reverse the order where he went A, B, C. Now he's going to go C, B, A. Good. So coming back, uh, the C prime, whatever you want to call it, is verses 27 through 38. And these are the opposite of the good qualities of God. These are the woe qualities the, the, of... The natural man qualities. Here is God. Here's what he's given you, but darn it, this is what and, you've done and with the it. the bullet points here are woe. And right? here the bullet points are woe, 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 woe. There's a whole bunch of them. We'll talk about them. Then starting in verse 39, he will be the counterpoint to these attributes of God. Oh, so in 39 we get the resumption of the other, the first six bullet points. Yes. We're going to get now the second okay, six bullet so, points. Uh, okay, so verse 39, he's talking to all my beloved brethren, be spiritual, seek life eternal. Mm -hmm. God is holy, he's saying, now, brethren, you become holy. Verse 40, be righteous, love truth. Uh, verse 41 through 43, remember God's path is straight. He is just. He had talked earlier about justice. Now he's saying you develop this attribute of justice. 44, remember my words. All are going to stand to be judged. Right. Whereas the earlier point was he is preparing us. This plan is preparing us for our judgment. It's a probationary period. It's really, it's a probationary period leading us to that judgment. 
uh, verses 45 through 51, shake off your sin, come to God. He is good, he is loving. Come on, come on, don't be, don't be scared of him, don't be hesitant, approach him, come to him. And then the last one of these, uh, these exhortations to his brethren in verse 52, he invites us to remember God's works, pray to him. <clears throat> He is knowing, he is wise, this and, is a plan. And the bullet points here is the phrase, oh my beloved brother. Oh my beloved brother. So we have O's, we have woes, we have oh my beloved brother. Yeah, that, that's a nice little O's, woes, and O's. You, 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 you have a way of teaching that, oh, yeah. about that little bit. President, President Kimball used to say, make your lessons powerful by making them simple. And for me, uh, the woes uh, take you away from Christ and the O's bring you to Christ. So we have the beginning taking us to Christ. We have the woes, the warning in the middle. Right. Don't go away from and him. And the O remembers and, that's what you need yes. to do. And, <laughs> and in the end, we have the O's again saying, come to Christ. Come to Christ. That okay. second O, it's in verse 10. Oh, how great the goodness of our God who prepared a way for us leads into an interesting discussion of, of death. And it's the two kinds of death, spiritual mm -hmm. death and physical death. I always like to think of the working definition of death as just being separation. Physical death is the separation of the body from the spirit. Spiritual death is the separation of us from God and from righteousness. But it's so colorful. I just love Jacob's poetic sense. Who prepared a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster death and hell, which I call death of the body. That's separation of our body from the spirit and death of the spirit, which isn't the annihilation of the spirit. It's the separation of the spirit from God. And because of the way of the deliverance of our God, the Holy One of Israel, this death which I have spoken of, which is temporal, shall deliver up its dead, which death is the grave. And then, of course, spiritual death, which is hell, uh, spirit prison, it delivers up those captive spirits once again because of the power of the Holy One. Uh, and, and Eric, verse 8 and 9 is probably the only place we have in Scripture, at least this clear, where it tells us the consequence, uh, what it would be like if we were not resurrected. If, if that awful monster was not overcome. Right, if the awful monster of uh, death of the body was not overcome, verse 8 in the middle there, we would be subject uh, to the devil, to that angel who fell from the present before the presence of the eternal God. And uh, verse 9, we would be in misery like unto himself. Uh, that, that's something to think about. That would have been the, the natural state of man after the fall. Right. Mm -hmm. But these verses 10 and 11 and 12 tell us that this, these consequences can be overcome. Now the third one here, starting in verse 13, oh great, the plan of our God. This was part of the plan. Yeah. There is a rescue mission as part of that expedition of coming to this earth life. And things can be restored again. Uh, these types of things, our unworthiness and, and, and such can all be overcome. I've always thought 13 was interesting because even paradise has to give up its spirits. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because yes. staying in paradise in the spirit world would not be That's not salvation. the end of it. That's not it's salvation. Not the end. We have to be delivered. I, ironically, it would still be a type of damnation. That is, your progress would have well, stopped. Section 138 says that even the righteous in the spirit world looked at the time from their separation from their bodies as a time of captivity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a deliverance even right. to come out of there. And, mm -hmm. and elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, this great plan of our God that's mentioned in this section is called the great plan of happiness mm -hmm. because it does relieve us from this death and monster that's being talked about. I wanted to say something about verse 14 here also, in the middle of this plan of happiness, uh, wherefore we shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt when we arrive at the judgment bar and our uncleanness and our nakedness. There's, there's a nice parallelism here. There's your, your guilt, your uncleanness, and your nakedness. And then the order is reversed. Again, you have the, right, uh, the, the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment, their righteousness, and being clothed with purity and so on. It's interesting that when resurrection is described later in the book of Alma in 11 and um, 42 that it's talked about, you know, perfect restoration of the body, every limb and joint, but here we have perfect restoration of memory. Mm -hmm. And you've got this perfect recollection of your guilt, or if you've repented of your guilt, of your righteousness. Mm -hmm. And your happiness and your cleanness. And, and that's why, why it's called the plan of happiness, because you really can be joyful and happy and clean. Uh, with the help of the atonement. I, I think we need to say it, even though I think most know this, that the word plan is never mentioned in the Old or New Testament. 
I, I, I don't know that because I'm a great scholar. I think it's because we have computers and we can look at that. <laughs> and never, ever, I mean, think about that. That's a pretty good sized book there. Never once is the word plan used in the Old or well, New and Testament. And I wonder if this, again, is how the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the Gospel, because the New Testament teaches the Atonement beautifully, but it doesn't always put it in the full context or in they the talk, plan. They may talk about a way or, or the Word of God, but it's sometimes that plain and simple English of the Book of Mormon, and all of a sudden, oh, that clicks. I mean, that, that makes a little more sense. They, 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 they may allude to it, but because they're using different vocabulary right. and phraseology, like in the Old Testament, they may talk about trust instead of faith. They may right. talk about turning your life around instead, instead of, of repenting. Right. But they're, they're talking about the same concepts. What if yeah. they talk about plan of happiness? Should we talk about a few woes? Yeah. Well, before yes. we get there, before we have, we get in verse nineteen, we get mercy again, like we've talked yeah. about, and, and we get the holiness in verse twenty. Well, and we get yes. the justice in verse seventeen. There, right. I mean, yep. it, it, it's everything's going to balance out. The trust in the Lord; it's all going to balance out. The atonement satisfied the demands of justice. Verse twenty-six. Yes, mm -hmm. but then in, in these little uh, transition here, okay, so here's what God is up through verse twenty. Now, starting in verse twenty-one, uh, He's going to fulfill this plan. He's going to do the suffering and so that the resurrection, verse 22, can come about. And then how do we really connect to it? Verse 23, we have to come unto Him. How do we take full advantage of right. the atonement? Come That's to right. Him, repent, or baptized in His name. And endure to the end up there here in verse 24. That's where the, one of the classic places where that we sometimes call it the Let's, fifth principle of the gospel right. shows up. Let's get on a few of the woes. We don't want to spend too much time on the woes, though. <laughs> well, we all have to repent. Let's get on the woes. <laughs> <laughs> one of the woes I think we really need to talk about is the one that's talked about in verse 29. I know yeah. you've had an experience with that, it, It's Eric. interesting because we say, you know, woe unto those who have the law and don't respond to it. Oh, the plan of the evil one. But then it says, it's, there's not actually a woe here, but verse 29, to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of the Lord. And I think all of us need to be careful of this, but, you know, when you talk about pride, as the preeminent sin that the Book of Mormon really teaches us. It's not just pride in material things, it's pride in knowledge, so-called. And, you know, all of us that happen to be here at this table are academics, and we spent time with that, and sometimes we think we know a lot. I remember when I was on my mission, my mission president called me in one of my last interviews, and he knew what my plans were academically, and he shared with me stories of people he knew who had gotten advanced degrees and got so caught up in that, they lost touch with the Spirit. He said, Elder, promise me you will always remember the Council of the Lord. It's great, get an education, study, learn. Learn it is good, to be learned is good, if you hearken to the counsels of the Lord. Yes. And speaking of hearkening to the counsels of the Lord, that's, a, that's, that's his, Jacob's transition to invite his brethren. Now let's hearken unto this, starting in verse 39. Oh, my beloved brethren, you see, now he's saying, he's doing the same thing with them like your mission president right. did with you. All right, you know. Now, let's just remind you here. Let's just reinforce this. Here's what you should be doing to, right now, right now. Uh, we need to mention just one last thing on the woes before you lead into the next one. Just for example, verse 31. And woe unto the deaf that will not hear. It's not the fact that they're deaf that's the problem. The problem they is choose they choose not to hear. Woe unto mm -hmm. the blind that will not see. Yes. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with physical deafness or blindness. It's spiritual and you have a and choice. It's, and it's willing not to Deliberate. do those kind of things. Good, mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Let's go on then and talk about these, uh, the next bullet points that you've uh, pointed out, Victor. Well, the, this first one, my beloved brethren, remember the awfulness in transgressing against the Holy God. And we've all had experiences, I assume, where we've had this guilt, where we, we recognize we have made mistakes and we need to not be carnally minded, but to be spiritually Isn't minded. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Remember to be carnally minded is death, spiritual death, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. Yeah. I, I've got to two sons that teach seminary, and they taught me this. Uh, they said, Dad, look at that. That's an acronym. Uh, spells the word smile. To be spiritually minded is life eternal. And I thought, <laughs> that's cute. I like that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the next bullet point, I think, begins in verse 40, is talking about truth. Yeah. And remember the greatness of the Holy One of Israel. That's the ultimate truth. God is good. He's good to us. 
Uh, how often, we talked about this in an earlier session, how often is the vocabulary of praise not part of our prayer life, not part of our living life? You've yes. got to recognize God. The next bullet point is verse 41, where we're going to talk about the straightness of the way and the justice of God. This has to play a part in the atonement also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The gate is the Holy One of Israel. It's not Peter or someone else. Well, the what the a powerful Lord passage. Is at that he gate. cannot be deceived, for the Lord is his name, and whoso knocketh to him will he open. Yes. It also hits me that there's a gate at the beginning, uh, baptism, receiving the Spirit, and then that gate at the end, and between it is the straight and narrow path. Mm -hmm. And we better have the Spirit, or we won't get from gate one to gate two. We've got to be following the good promptings point. of the Spirit to get to uh, this gate. And then at, 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 uh, verse 45 begins the part about shaking off the sins and become holy like our God. Well, well, for, we'll back up here to verse 44 here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> my beloved brother, remember my words. I, I take off my garments, I shake them before. It's interesting how often the prophets will basically state, I've done my part. Mm -hmm. This is what I've done. Here's something to witness it. That, that, mm -hmm. that, that I've done my part, now it's your part, and then the one in 45, now your part is to turn away from your sins. Again, Old Testament, Book of Mormon language for repent. Just turn away. Turn yeah. away, yeah. Because if you don't, what happens is, is uh, outlined there in verse 46, if you don't turn around. Because you're going to be brought to stand before God, and you might want to shrink with awful fear, unless you've repented, of course. Uh, isn't that terrible? You have to confess. Holy <laughs> are thy judgments, O Lord God Almighty, but I know my guilt. And, 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 I transgress thy law. And, and the reason that happens, of course, is back in verse 14, where you have, at that point, a perfect knowledge. Right of your righteousness or your guilt. And so when you stand before God, there won't be a whole lot of, of words exchanged probably, mm -hmm. but you will simply say, oh Lord God, you're right. Poor, yeah. poor Jacob, you know, he does it here, he's gonna have to do it again in the book of Jacob. He's, he's like a bishop, you know, you just have to keep preaching mm -hmm. about these same things. Look at verse 48, if, I, if ye were holy, I would speak unto you of holiness, but as ye are not holy, and you look at me as your teacher, I'm your leader, I've got to teach you the consequences. Now the word holy, by the way, in this little section right here from 45 through 51, the word holy appears seven times in just these few verses. And, and holy is, we ought to connect it to it as Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, from the, in, in, in German, Paul and I know this, uh, the name of the church is Kirche Jesu Christi der Heiligen der Letzten Tage. Heilig, the holy ones. Well, that's what saints are in the New Testament. Hagioi is those who are holy, those who are set apart to God. Set apart to God, consecrated for a sacred purpose. And so the great title here in this chapter, I mean, the word holy appears, uh, oh, let's see, where did I have it written? 25 times the word holy or holiness appears here. Many of them. Uh, That's throughout a, the whole sermon. I mean, throughout the, the whole, chapter well, nine. Just this chapter. Yeah, I mean, yeah, chapter nine, 25 yeah. times. Uh, and often applying to Christ, the Holy One of Israel, the one consecrated for a sacred purpose. Now that ties in with the title we use for him, Christ, mm -hmm. the anointed one. That's the actual act of consecration right. is being emphasized when we say the anointed one, the Christ. But he's saying now, if you were holy, if you were consecrated for a sacred purpose, then I could talk to you more about it. Right. If right. You, that is, if you were living up to I assume that these people already have been taught some of this stuff. They're not living up to the holiness part of their covenant, and he's calling them to it. You're, you're supposed to be saints. Well, act like saints. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Beautiful. And uh, you say that uh, that last bullet point ends with, uh, with, with 50, 50. Yeah, 51, and then 51. 52, Behold my beloved brother, and is, is in our next little short one there. And this is a lovely conclusion to all of this part, this, the, uh, verses 52 and 53. Behold, my beloved one, remember the words of your God, pray unto him continually by day, and give thanks unto his holy name by night. Beautiful Hebrew poetry, by day and by night you're going to pray. I don't think it means you're going to be praying all day and all night. It means you pray. During the day and during the night, there's, there's not a time limit, or you know, cut it off at six. If you haven't done it, wait till tomorrow. No. No. 
And behold, how great the covenants of the Lord, and how now great His condescension, we at the beginning. which yeah. ties it back right into the first verse of chapter 9 again. Well, and how great the condescension, His condescensions unto the children of men. This ties it back to his brother Nephi's vision, First Nephi 11. In fact, it's interesting how often Jacob comes back to that. Mm -hmm. It's the condescension, Jesus becoming man, accomplishing the atonement. And even 49 above, it starts off a little negative there. My, my soul abhorred sin, and I think that is certainly true. Uh, we should hate sin, but my heart delighteth in righteousness. And that was at the first. Because of the covenants, I can lift up my head and rejoice. Stan, can you give us a short summary of uh, what we've discussed today? Well, it's a big order. But yeah, <laughs> to me, it's the plan of salvation. Um, it, it, it really uh, revolves around, of course, uh, the covenants. It begins and ends with covenants. Um, but at the heart of it uh, really is the atonement, as has been expressed. Uh, the, the one that, that's overcome that awful monster, death and hell. Uh, if it wasn't for that, uh, we could not be scattered or gathered or anything else. We've got to have uh, that awful monster overcome. But in that covenant relationship, the covenant demands obedience. And so there's a couple of woes we need to be careful of and a couple of woes that we ought to be concerned about. And so the woes uh, coming to Christ and the woes being careful not to be led away. And uh, finally, uh, again, we return to covenants that uh, we need to trust in the Lord. Uh, and as been pointed out uh, in the New Testament uh, wordage, faith. We've got to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I suspect that the word covenant here is, is used in a very broad sense. It's the covenants that we also made in the preexistence. And we're all going to be uh, held accountable for all of those. And this ties in together now why God can take Israel back after she uh, was in the rest of the sermon there. It's because of the atonement that all of us can come back with God. The ultimate gathering. The ultimate, right. the ultimate gathering. Thank you, brethren. It's been a pleasure to be with you.